Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and you're listening to Mushing Radio here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site and you can find all of our episodes over on DogWorksRadio.com. Be sure to check out our social channels. Just search for DogWorks Radio. And today we are welcoming a Willow a resident. She is one of the organizers for a couple of races, and we're going to talk about the Willow 300, which takes part this weekend. Her name is Christine Stitt. Christine, how's it going? It's going well. I'm enjoying the temperatures and the weather. It is a cold winter, isn't it? <laughs> that it is. That it is, but needed. It is needed. Not a lot of snow here, and I know a lot of races have uh, thought about being canceled. I know the Connect 200 was canceled earlier on, but it looks like the Willow 300 is going to take place here in just a couple of days. Before we jump into that, Chris, can you introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about you, please? All right. Well, my name again is Christine Stitt. Um, I have been a resident in Willow for 18 years. We uh, decided to go with a race with the Willow Dog Mushers Association three years back. Wade Mars and Sophie De Bruin decided they would like to see about a, a different kind of race. So we got together, uh, them with Willow Dog Mushers, of course, and developed a 300-mile race. I did a Rod Yukon Quest qualifier, but in the difference of this race, uh, it was to be a mass start, which is like one of a kind with that many mushers out on in one area on Willow Lake. So um, I've been involved with that now for four years. Last year, of course, we did have to cancel due to weather. But this year, it looks like we're a go. And I've been actively involved with the Willow Dog Mushers for... So with the Willow 300, if I'm correct, that race has come through a couple of iterations. Uh, way back when, it was, um, I believe, known as the uh, the Willow Tug Race and uh, ran a, a very similar trail to what you run now. And now here we are with the Willow 300. Can you tell us a little bit of history about that? Because I know that um, when they took it over, that was really the first 300 miler in a while because before that that they had the Don Bowers 300 and that has disbanded yes. several years ago, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, the Don Bowers did disbanded. Then yes, they tried uh, to do the Willow tug and then the Willow tug decided to turn into the Northern light. So uh, they went with uh, happy trail kennels, which uh, helped them with their start and finish and everything it was a really nice place to have a race. And then just uh, three years ago, Wade Mars decided that he'd like to see another qualifier because there weren't enough qualifiers. And some, of course, and then we'd cancel, and, and there are some areas of the state that have more snow than others. But um, we decided that uh, it was a go. We put off our first race in 2017 as the Willow 300. And actually, that was the name that Wade Mars gave it. And then uh, we did 2018 as well, um, another successful race. And then, of course, in 2019, unable to run. And now 2020, uh, scheduled to take off Thursday morning as, uh, again, an, a good qualifying race. We've got some awesome trails. 
So you run uh, or you start the race, as you mentioned, Chris, uh, as a mass start in Willow, right there on Willow Lake. And for folks that are listening, that is the same lake that they use for the Iditarod restart. Where does it go from there? Can you give us a quick outline of the trail route, route, please? Okay, so as far as I know, and you'll learn this one thing about me, is trails is not my uh, strong point. But we'll leave Willow Lake and we'll travel all around the big swamp and Sioux, Deshka area, and then head out to Susitna Landing. And then from Susitna Landing, they'll be taking some known trails north to Trapper Creek. Some of these trails are already put in. Uh, some of these trails are Iditarod trails. I'm not sure where all the mix-up is, but they're, they're all combined. And then from Trapper Creek, we will then head west over to Forks Roadhouse. And then from Forks Roadhouse, we'll take the trails and head back to the east over to Sheep Creek Lodge, where the finish will be. Awesome. And, and that was uh, some of those same trails that they used to run on the, the Don Bauer several years ago. Yeah. That, uh, those trails aren't nearly used as much as the, uh, the, Willow, the, the, the trail south of there in Willow, you know, all of that uh, busy traffic mm-hmm. heading towards uh, getting a station and all that. So do you guys have a heck of a time putting in the trail and making sure that it's, uh, that it's runnable? Or is this something that uh, uh, is already established, if you will? Well, we're gonna we're gonna leave it at it's all it's now now just established uh, last year and of course every year there's little hiccups and of course this year our normal route would have been to leave Willow Lake and proceed to Sheep Creek Lodge then to Trapper Creek but those trails were not able to be put in due to water and the, the big Sioux so they've rerouted and and gone that way so i would say that they're established we've got an amazing trail crew people actually the trail crew that we have have been involved with the don bauer the earl north and so uh or not the earl north excuse me the don bauer and the northern light and uh they've come on board they've established these trails they've been working on these trails and they're basically ready to go um we're keeping the the original trail system that we have and it's uh you know they've been out working they work oh they work they work so hard but they're making it happen and like i said most of the trails down below uh which when i say down below in the willow area those have all been put in by bill luth who who maintains these trails the trail committees that are out there grooming, all these trails, most of these trails are already set in place from other races or other events. And you guys have a special place because, if I'm not mistaken, you guys are the only 300-mile qualifier in the Matsu Valley. The closest one to us is the Copper Basin, which is up there in the Copper River Valley. And then they just started one up in the Alpine Creek area just this year. But you guys kind of hold that special place of of having the only 300-mile qualifier. Is that right? Yeah, at this time, yeah, the Northern Light. Um, did not run last year. They uh, closed up shop there. That was um, greatly missed. And then the Testamina, uh, which, you know, it's not close to us, but it is a race that a lot of mushers would go to for qualifiers as well. Um, that's not running this year. So, yeah, we are the only 300-mile race that I'm aware of in the Matsu Valley and, you know, all the way up to close to the Alpine race that they just put in this year. So, Chris, what is your role with the organization? I am co-director coordinator. I, I'm helping our new director, Mary Ann Schottmeyer. Uh, she's taken over uh, most of the responsibilities with all the tech. She's very tech savvy. And so my part is checkpoints, veterinarians, volunteers, the start, um, just making sure that all these events go as planned. And uh, then we have other volunteers that have stepped up and are heading up checkpoints uh, and and whatnot. So mine is basically overseeing, making sure it all goes well. And if there's any problems, hopefully try and fix them and take care of them before they get out of control. 
I don't think we've ever talked on this show about the process to become a qualifier, and maybe you can answer some of those questions in a second. But for folks that are listening, I'm sure they know that this isn't something you just start planning in uh, at the end of uh, at the end of December and and make it go. Is this a, a multi month job for you? Does it start uh, well before the snow flies? Give us sort of a behind the scenes effort that it takes to get to the starting line this week. Uh, okay, I would say that uh, the effort started uh, two weeks after last year's race canceled. Uh, this is a year-long process. We uh, finances, sponsorship, of course, the trails, um, getting the volunteers, putting everything in order, getting the meeting set up, coordinating with the race uh, uh, marshal and trails. Um, it's a constant barrage of going and going. We don't push it too much until we get to just about October. We open the signups October 1st. And from October 1st until this race is over and our recap meeting, it's nonstop. We go every single day. There's straw, there's drop bags, there's transportation, there's off road. Uh, we have one off road checkpoint this year which has us having to rearrange all of our schedules to get drop bags out there uh snow machine uses we've got trail people we've got the checkpoint people that have to all come together and get coordinated so that they're able to run the checkpoint efficiently for the mushers and so that takes time going out there working shoveling grooming packing whatever it takes so that we can get these teams 40 teams into each checkpoint uh, safely and efficiently. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a constant process. It doesn't stop all year long. So, Christine, you had talked about some of the races that are no longer around, including the Northern Lights, the Willow Tug, the Tustamina, maybe, uh, the Don Bowers, all of those races, maybe even the Connect 200. I was talking to Bob Sexton this weekend, and he says they're uh, they're sort of in that uh, quandary right now. What do you think the state of mushing is right now as a race organizer? Uh, there's, there's always going to be, uh, you know, mushers raring to go, especially if the purses are good, but what are your thoughts on sort of the state of mushing on a racing perspective? Boy, on a racing perspective, I've never been a racer. <laughs> I've never been an organizer. Um, I would have to say that um, it, there's a dim outlook for qualifiers, and every year when we hear about another race not running that year, it gives us, you know, a little bit more of a Oh my goodness! You know we really need to make this race go, uh, and but you know you weather can't you can't control the weather and the weather controls the races. So um, you know it. Last year they wanted to call it global warming. This year we're so cold, you know. So I, I think the outlook is that if there's an availability of trails and organizations that are willing to put the time and effort and work into running a race. As many can tell you, the Testaminas, Earl Norris, Tom Bowers, Knick, they all can tell you the process of putting a race together and it not running just, you know, it, it, it makes everybody feel just downhearted. But um, we just have to keep plugging forward and hope the best for the weather and the trails and the people to be involved. There are a lot of people that have kind of, you know, whittled out. They've been doing it for so long, and I don't blame them, you know. But at the same time, it's all about the volunteers. It's all about those willing to want to help, to help see the races go forward. So, you know, that's that's kind of where I think racing is. It, it, I don't think it's too dim, but at the same time, we have seen a lot of races come and go. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm in that same boat, too. I don't know how many years over the past uh, nine or ten years I've signed up for races and in, intent on qualifying. And, you know, when you sign up in October, you have your race schedule ready. And, and then often when you sign up for these races and it gets canceled in, say, January, it's difficult to do another race. So then that puts you back 
a, a following year. You know, you're you're kind of playing oh, that yeah. playing that domino effect. And for folks that uh, that are trying to qualify for the quest or the Iditarod, that can become a a really long multi year process to do that. If especially if these three hundred mile races get canceled, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I know for a fact that it it does. It definitely affects the mushers when a race cancels. They've again, as you well know, you have you have coordinated yourself, you have scheduled yourself, and, and you know where you're going. You know the miles, you know the races, and then when they start not happening, I think that puts a lot of stress on those qualifiers who really want to get in to run the Iditarod in the Quest. And I, you know, I couldn't imagine being in their shoes last year when we canceled. We canceled just a day or two before the race. And when that happened, uh, we actually had a couple that uh, the Yukon Quest 300 had canceled. And they called and said, are you running your race? At the time, we were. So these people came in from Canada and crossed the border, came in just for us to call them a day later and tell them that we weren't running. So I would imagine that's real difficult for mushers, uh, especially for those trying to train to get into the bigger races. And I don't know what the miles are for accumulation for I did a ride to run, but I know that there's at least a um, thousand to 1500 miles that they have to have for qualifiers. Uh, yeah. They have to do two, three hundreds and then either a 200 or a one fifty. So they have to have at gotcha. least seven fifty. but most okay. people uh, would prefer to have much more than that. You know, you can, yeah. you, you're just wet behind the ears at, at that for sure. So Christine, do you know any of the process that it takes to get qualified to be a qualifier? Do you know anything about that? You know what? Um, I do not. I just know that you're that you you run your qualifying races. You have to be finishing within a certain amount of time. Um, they actually have what they call a report card. No, uh, I'm uh, 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 Christine. I mean, for the race, do you know what the process oh. that it takes to become an Iditarod qualifier with uh, with that organization? Because I know you guys are are one of those. Um, no, I do not. I, I, again, I don't, all I do is just my organizational parts, but when it comes to the process of being a qualifier, um, I, uh, oh, you mean the, I'm sorry. I'm getting a little bit confused. The race to be a qualifier, that's what you're asking. Yes. Yes. Okay. For the race to be a qualifying race, we have to have at least 275 to 280 miles minimal for contacting, or we're calling it a 300 mile race. Okay. Of course, we all like to have that 300 miles. Uh, you have to go by certain rules. There are certain uh, rules that you you maintain with uh, Iditarod standards. So there are several Iditarod rules that we have that are the same. So and if you know Iditarod um, puts in anything new, I, I'll, I'll tell you that at one point we had an Iditarod uh, uh, musher who was disqualified. Uh, not able to run the next year, but uh, we were able to let them run this qualifier race, even though that wasn't a qualifier for them, but they were still able to run the race. Um, there, most of the rules and regulations do coincide with I did a rod and or quest. Right. It's mainly about maintaining the miles and the good racing rapport and getting the information and, 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 and coming in at a decent time you scratch of course you, you know you don't you don't get your qualified <laughs> and of course uh things are, are consistent amongst all the races about uh the mushers having the right gear and mandatory stops yeah. and, and all of that so christine yeah. we have just a few more minutes left on this show and we had already talked about the uniqueness of the willow 300 about uh it being on trails that a lot of folks don't use anymore the mass start but you guys attract a lot of competition it's it's really a who's who of mushing in your race you you've had people run from all over the world what is aside from the qualifier and aside from even being uh one of the very few races what is the draw for uh for your race you know you always talk about uh, you always hear about you know, each race does something special, whether it's the checkpoints or the food on the trail or the volunteers or the scenery or the trail itself. What is really the draw for the Willow 300? Um, I'm going to assume that it would be the mass start for one. I mean, it, it's just crazy down there on the lake. 
and um, no timing, so we don't have to do any time adjustments. The mushers are able to head out, get their checkpoints. Uh, another uh, fun thing about this race is if you're not an Iditarod qualifier, you have outside assistance, which means the Iditarod mushers or maybe just mushers just running it um, are able to use outside assistance. means when they pull into that checkpoint, they can go get the rest they want, they need, they can eat and then get back with their team. Their handlers are there taking care of everything for them. So I think that draws some of the bigger names like Ramey Smith, Jim Lanier, Lance Mackey's running it this year, Christy and Anna Barrington. Uh, we got some, you know, bigger names out there that are just running it, and they enjoy those uh, those little things that they, they get to do, the mass start, uh, the handler assistance. And, of course, I think the food, uh, Sheep Creek Lodge, Trapper Creek Trading Post, Forks Roadhouse, they all offer inside lodging, nice, hot, warm food. Um, just the whole environment, I think, draws the race. But I think the most part is the mass start and the outside assistance that they get. Well, you guys are definitely doing it right for sure. And, and I'm sure that uh, your hope is to keep this running for many more years in the future. Christine, how can folks find out about uh, this race? We're going to air this actually the same day that it starts. Do you guys have trackers? Do you have uh, an active Facebook page? Where is the best place for fans to follow along on the race? Definitely track leaders. Uh, we, they will be, we will have trackers on them. Uh, our Facebook page is going to be active at all times. Marianne Shutmire will be doing all updates. Um, yeah, I would say your best bet is track leaders and through your Facebook, uh, through the Willow 300 Sled Dog Race Facebook page, and you'll be able to follow it through. Excellent. Christine Stitt is our guest today here on Mushing Radio. We'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company. Learn more at firstpaw.coffee. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forda and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com.